welcome to the Tron Church Talking Points podcast. Um, I'm here today with Phil Copeland and Paul Brennan, who are both preaching on Sunday. And we're just going to chat through some of the things that, um, some of the highlights um, from the sermons on Sunday um, morning and evening. So um, we're going to just kick off looking at 1 Kings 18. Um, Phil, you're preaching on this passage and we stopped at verse 40. So just, um, there's lots in this passage, but um, one of the big things that came across um, were both Obadiah and Elijah um, were men who feared the Lord, um, but they're both very different. Um, maybe you could talk about that a little bit, just because um, they obviously were very different with very different tasks, weren't they? Yep, definitely. So Obadiah, we just can meet him out of the blue, really. He's different from the writing prophet. It's highly unlikely that this was the same Obadiah. But we're told that he was serving in the house of Ahab under that evil king, and yet he's a man of integrity. Verse 3 says he feared the Lord, not just a little, but greatly. And uh, just wanted to make the point there that, you know, sometimes you can read these Bible stories and you can read them, look at the main character who's been held up and, and think, oh, I, I've got to dare to be an Elijah. I've got to be an Elijah, you know, and that might be really painful for you because you might not be as confrontational as Elijah. You might not have the same kind of personality. Uh, but actually, just having this contrast with Obadiah and Elijah there, it reminds us, well, faithfulness doesn't come in one flavour, says one of the commentators. Um, actually, they're, they're, there's a wonderful variety in the service of the Lord, wonderful diversity in that um, Obadiah was different, he was much more quiet in the background when he hid those prophets. Um, but he, he did it because he feared the Lord in the sphere in which the Lord had placed him mm. in that particular place. And I think that's probably the main challenge. You know, it's I'm not saying, I wasn't saying on Sunday there's not things that we can learn from Elijah. We can. For example, James 5 speaks about Elijah being a, a model prayer. We're to... Uh, follow his example of of uh, a righteous man praying we'll look at that god willing this coming sunday but um we're not to be elijah clones or to feel like we're just to be elijah clones and that everyone imagine if everyone in the church was as confrontational <laughs> and as in your face as maybe elijah was here um it's just it's not gonna be a really healthy church <laughs> and you were saying so. that people do they get a hard time uh, just they give Obadiah a hard time, but yeah, some of the writers, uh, commentators, uh, when uh, Obadiah meets Elijah, and Elijah says, "Go and tell Ahab that I've appeared," because remember Elijah at this point has been in hiding for three years, uh, and we're told that Ahab has done all sorts of like foreign missions to try and find Elijah desperately. He was so angry at, at the Lord's prophet, and um. Obadiah is worried that Elijah's going to put him to death. Um, he says it three times, I think verse 9, verse 12, verse 14. But, uh, you know, Obadiah's just been human. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. he's having a moment. I mean, who, you know, shock horror. There's a person who doesn't want to die. Yeah. Um, and is scared of death like that. But but um, the text doesn't, you know, rebuke Obadiah. The Lord doesn't rebuke Obadiah. Um, I think a lot of the times when commentators diss people in the Bible for maybe lacking confidence under pressure, they're probably doing it from a very cosy study as they sit in a lovely leather chair, you know, mm. with a cup of coffee <laughs> in a in a land where they're not persecuted for their faith. But yeah. um we just we gotta watch we don't do that. We don't kinda of set ourselves above people in the past. Yeah, um, that's right. We'll but, pay attention to how the, the writers presenting each of these characters. And that's one of the things about the Old Testament narratives, isn't it? They're so mm -hmm. they're so real and you know, you don't get a sort of a rosy yeah. sort of rose tinted yeah. version of characters. You get real characters yeah. and as you say, it could be quite easy to sort of sit in judgment over yeah. Obadiah and say, Oh, I would have done that differently. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah. I mean, he's done quite a bit, hasn't he? He's hidden away hundred prophets. Yeah. It's a amazing. great risk, and he's fed them, yeah, and yeah. you know, mm. yeah, he's done. And yeah, he would have been exactly. killed, wouldn't he, if he'd been yeah. found out to be doing yep. that? Definitely. Like, but I think what's so encouraging is the fact that you know both Elijah and Obadiah fear the Lord, who's mm. the right mm. one to fear, isn't it? Instead mm. of Ahab, mm. um, and that's why they're prepared to do these great 
like, yeah. re- like um, commands and, and mm. obey them because they fear God over these things. So, Definitely. I mean, like, how do we, how should we like think about this then in terms of like when we're in situations where we're fearful and we're not really wanting mm. to speak the truth, but we kind of know we should, mm-hmm. you know, how should we? Well, I think there's one little thing. So if you look at, if you've got Bible in front of you, in verse 15, Elijah, when he's giving encouragement to uh, Obadiah, he reminds him that the Lord is the Lord of hosts. And that little phrase there is talking about the fact that, I think I said this in the sermon, the Lord is the Lord of the armies of heaven. And it's that actually, along with his assurance that he's Elijah's not going to disappear all of a sudden, mm-hmm. um, that, that, that seems to boost up his brother in the faith, Obadiah. And uh, I think that's a key thing that helps us is when men seem big, the answer is to remember we have a much bigger God <laughs> and remember the the power of the Lord. And mm. I'm sure, for, you know, for Obadiah seeing Elijah taking that stand and, mm-hmm. you know, it's encouraging for us when we see other people taking a stand. And it's often the sort of folk that in the eyes of the world wouldn't necessarily, you wouldn't deem them as being brave but when they when they make a stand, however yeah. small it is, that gives me courage. Definitely. So and so can yeah. make that stand in the workplace or Yep. Um well I can do that. Yeah, Paul talks about that at the start of Philippians one, doesn't he? Um that his imprisonment the result of his imprisonment mm. is that more people are standing up and are willing to stick their head above the parapet mm. and speak the truth. Um and uh yeah. This courageousness is sometimes infectious, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. I heard of somebody um, recently who'd basically just stood up to his boss and said oh, wasn't gonna, he wasn't going to do something that was actually immoral and um, turns out he gets a promotion the week after. So oh. <laughs> it just shows you that like, wow. God bless his obedience yeah. and you know, it's, it's right to fear the Lord and not mm. fear your boss and mm. other mm. people. So mm. yeah, not that you're always going to get promoted. <laughs> <laughs> just for the record. But yeah, true, yeah. True. Um, one thing I th- thought was very striking was, and you mentioned this, uh, Phil, that um, this whole idea of like the big question throughout this chapter is who is God? Yeah, that's and true. you know, you have Elijah speaking to the people um, at Mount Carmel saying, you know, how long will you go limping between these two different opinions? Mm. If the Lord is Lord, follow him, but if Paul then follow him and the people did not answer him a word and it just made me think about you know that kind of you know you do become like what you worship and mm-hmm. the fact that they become dumb they, they do not speak they don't have anything to say yep um yes they they're described in the same way here they're described here in the same way as the prophets of baal and the, the limp around this chaotic and it's a horrible word in the hebrew hard to translate um but then it's kind of directionless and chaotic and bumping into stuff and not rooted and it sounds like a horrible existence. And they also are described as having no answer, which is just like Baal mm-hmm. throughout the chapter. Uh, when the prophets cry out, the prophets of Baal cry out to him, there was no answer. There's nothing. Um, the common thing in that you find in the major writing prophets, like Isaiah, for example, he will mock those who follow idols and say that you know you you just become like them. Mm-hmm. It's a it's a and it's a heartbroken mockery. It's a, yeah. It's like a mockery that Elijah uses here. It's meant to try and expose, but to bring people to repentance. Yeah. So it's a mockery that, that that's full of mercy. Actually. So should we could we do this while we are talking to people who are like t- t- telling us about like the the gods that they worship i mean to what extent do we apply this to ourselves you know because you talked about a godly mocking or yeah kind of teasing in a way um the, mm. the gods of the Baal. um so how do we kind of yeah how do we treat people who worship things and are quite sort of overt about it and yeah i think trying to expose the reality of what they're doing because there may not be a realisation that mm-hmm. what's really undergirding their behaviour, their beliefs, maybe they're not really interrogated their beliefs in any way. And so I think a good thing to do is sort of begin to interrogate mm-hmm. why is it you think that or why are you behaving like this or why is it you give your life to serving this and making sacrifices for this? And they probably won't think of it in terms of worshipping or yeah. idolatry. They won't have it in those categories, but trying to help people see actually their lives are centred around something. Mm-hmm. And what is it? Um, 
Yeah. You're, you're giving us an example, Katie. You know, you've been out on the streets and, yeah. you know, the, your displays seek to educate on the life of the unborn. But you've had, you had an interaction recently yes. where you yeah. kind of saw this sort of, oh, absolutely. This, this sort of thing very we were, vividly. Yeah, that's right. We were out a few weeks ago and on, on Buchanan Street and for about an hour and a half there were people chanting our body our choice um keep your rosaries off our ovaries and other things like that um but when we tried to engage in conversation they they wouldn't discuss it they wouldn't talk to us um one man in particular didn't even engage in conversation or look at me and it it just this it just made me think of this situation that that they're their thinking is is chaotic at best, mm-hmm. but it's like there's very little thought. But because they they're trying to protect it because it's their what they worship mm. this yep. false identity, an identity in something that's not real. Um, they can't. It's almost like they couldn't engage because it would be too much of a threat to them. Um, there's no confidence there, is yeah, there to none. be able to defend what they think. Or... Yeah. No. Absolutely. Yeah, that's quite revealing. Yeah, mm-hmm. very revealing. And I think what's really good about this passage is that you know elijah isn't trying to belittle them but he's trying to expose the mm-hmm. truth and i think mm. he, it's a grace and a mercy that he's doing that isn't it because he could yes. have just left them yep. and been like right god is going to deal with you yep. you know you're all you know, this is going to end very badly for all of you but he doesn't do that you no. know and i think that's why yeah like the mercy and the grace of god comes across yeah. so well Definitely. Like all of this, I mean, Elijah makes it plain in his prayer, um, verse 36, that he has done all these things at your word, at the Lord's word. This is the Lord graciously revealing himself to people. Um, but they, get, they, do, they, give, they give the um, prophets of Baal, you know, the chance to basically... What's the what's the expression? Enough rope to hang themselves. Mm-hmm. You know they. You know they. He lets them go first. You crack on, and they're so exposed. Um, I think go back to the thing about the godly mockery with people. I think uh, I think though as well that is maybe not the best wisest place to start when you're talking to maybe a non-Christian contact by like like laughing at their <laughs> beliefs. You know, but uh, in a in a in a maybe cold-hearted way, callous. But that's not what you see in the Bible, but, um, yeah. So, (laughs) um, but I think, uh, definitely you want to try and just expose the, the massive gaping holes maybe in their Mm -hmm. thinking, maybe where things contradict each other. Yeah. So whereas, you know, the biblical worldview, the, the whole story of the Bible is so coherent and makes sense and logical. And, um, I think you want to show that, but, you know, the beauty of, as well of of how different life is under the Lord, yeah. I I've always found of this passage, verse twenty eight, just chilling, the fact that the prophets of Baal just they they cut themselves and their the blood is gushing everywhere. The harm of that, but yeah. that, that's in the end, that's that's always what lies will do to people. Yeah, will bring destruction and harm and it's chaos. When, isn't yeah, it, it yeah. is. It's totally and totally contrast isn't yeah. it, to Elijah. Yeah, and you couldn't have more. Yeah, yeah. You know, here's this chaos. Four hundred fifty of them. Raving around, and then mm. there's Elijah, yeah, quietly praying. Yeah, it's a blessing of like living under God, who we uh-huh. were made to like, be living, isn't it? And yeah. one thing you mentioned in this section about you know what they were doing, and um, the fact that they were basically cutting themselves, they were crying aloud, um, you know, they were basically raving around, um, basically to try and manipulate Baal. Yep. And one sort of parallel you drew was just like asking that question do we think we can make God do things for us yeah. in the way that we live or the what we do? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, Paul, you were talking about something you'd heard or sort of that bit earlier. Yeah, I can't remember who was, what the situation was, but it was a sort of pastoral situation where somebody was very anxious about a particular thing and uh, just very worked up about it and just feeling a need to sort of constantly be praying about this matter and you know, the Lord needs to answer this. And I think, um, you know, the pastor said to this person, look, let's pray about this now. Let's pray to the Lord. And then I do not want you to pray about it again mm-hmm. because the Lord knows he is sovereign. We can pray to him. And we don't need to pray like the pagans. We don't need to babble on and, yes. you know, multiply our words. Yep. Let's pray about this now once and then leave it to him. Mm-hmm. Um, we can't manipulate the Lord. 
but he's sovereign. He hears our prayer, so we can trust him. And in the same way that Elijah does here, he just prays simply and once. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> doesn't keep going on like all day yeah. like the other worshippers of Baal did. Yeah. Um, yep. So we can't manipulate the Lord. No. We can pray to him, of course, Mm -hmm. but then we can leave it with him. Yeah. I mean, that comes across so clearly, doesn't it? The fact that, like, this is a living God who, you know, in that one prayer, like you say, um, answers Elijah and, like, consumes, um, like, the fire comes down and consumes everything um, and licks up all the water that was in the trench. And it's just, the contrast is so stark, isn't it? And Mm -hmm. really helpful because it just makes it so crystal clear that the Lord... um, he is God, like they were all saying in response. And um, it's quite shocking, I think, the fact that, you know, um, I can't remember if you said this, Phil, but um, you're talking about the mercy of God, the fact that, um, yes, the prophets um, of Baal, uh, they were captured and slaughtered, Mm -hmm. but God's people, um, he had mercy on them. He didn't do that to them. And just the kindness of God. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, very striking. That's something that's really struck me all the way through the book is just how again and again the Lord gives people time. Yeah. Um and uh and and it's all about the business of turning people's hearts back to him and mm-hmm. uh, sovereign salvation. Yeah. And that I if, wondered if there was another sermon we maybe heard about that sometime recently, was there? What a segue. Seamless, what a segue. Segue. Oh, so, smooth. Yeah. Smooth. <laughs> Should write a book and on so that. Thank you. Thank you. You barely noticed. Yeah. So, Paul, um, in Acts, we do actually, we do come across the mercy of God again, don't we? And, mm. um, yeah, it was a brilliant, it's such a, a great passage full of encouragements. And um, one of the, the things that you mentioned, which I thought was really striking, was that there's a quote about death. And, like, you were kind of challenging this idea that we distance ourselves from death, but it's not as far away as we think. Can you yes. maybe talk about that? Well, yeah, I mean, the Philippian jailer, you know, it's a typical evening, but suddenly, <laughs> within a matter of moments, he's got his sword drawn, he's about to fall on his own sword, and he's suddenly confronted with death. And, you know, we don't often consider it, do we? Uh, we sort of push death to the fringes, we don't mm. really think about our mortality. But this is a story where someone really was confronted with it, and actually we need to be confronted with it too, because... Death is not a, not as far away as we think. Yeah. And I, I came across this quote. I can't remember where it was from, but um, the writer says, you know, that all that separates us from eternity is a thin partition of time and sense, and so thin that one might swear we sometimes can hear whispers from the other side. And in this instance, in the Philippian jailer, those whispers become a loud voice of thunder that unnerved and unhinged him. Hmm. And suddenly he was having to deal with major questions and mm-hmm. I think we need to sometimes be awakened yeah. and realise that eternity is, is there's a thin partition. Yeah. yeah. It's never yeah. very far away. Definitely. Yeah. I mean you think about when you meet people in hospital um, whether they have had faith historically or not, people pray. Like most people will be mm-hmm. prayers in those scenarios whether they know God or not. And so it's that kind of um, the reality is that we are we have eternity mm. in our hearts, don't we? And that mm. we know we're we're not just this life. And um, yeah, I think you know, no matter how old you are, it's often hard to like realize and think about death because it's not a very nice mm. thing to think about. But it's so important, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> because if we don't, we'll never be ready for it. And mm-hmm. um, and uh, yeah, I guess that's not the only reason, obviously for thinking about it, that we're all going to die, but we need to be ready to meet the Lord, don't we, when we do die? Mm -hmm. Um, And I think one thing which you pulled out in this passage, Paul, was about, um, you talked quite a lot about suffering, um, and you talked a bit, quite a bit about, like, Paul and Silas, their response to suffering Mm. um, is a challenge, isn't it? Um, But also how God uses it. Yeah. Well, the suffering on, on both both sides, there's the Philippian jailer himself mm-hmm. and, you know, he's in a very real sense suffering in that moment as he contemplates the end, he's about to fall on his sword. But there's also the suffering that Paul and Silas have gone through and, you know, they've spent time in prison and I don't suppose that was a particularly pleasant place to be. They've been beaten and, 
uh, put in the stocks. And yet, yeah, it's in the midst of all that, they're worshipping and praising the Lord because, well, they count it a privilege, don't they? Mm-hmm. And Paul mm-hmm. talks about that in his letter to the Philippian church later on. But it's a privilege to join with Christ's sufferings. And it's it's through those sufferings that God is at work to complete his His purposes and his plans. And we don't often see that in the moment. Mm-hmm. Like Paul and Silas would have no concept at the start of that evening yeah. as they were sat in prison that this was going to be about this is going to bring about the deliverance mm. and the salvation of the jailer. Um but that is what the Lord was doing. Yeah. yeah. Um and his household, which is yeah. yeah. Um so often we well we do we do not have the Lord's perspective do we and we yeah. can't see yeah. uh at the time often the reasons for our suffering but they are in God's sovereign plans are going to be used by him, but we may not know why. And we may not know why for a long time or ever, yeah. uh, this side of eternity. But, uh, you know, the Lord can use these things. Definitely. It does sort of strike me the, the fact that, like, what happened, even though there was an earthquake, the fact that all the doors were open and everyone's bonds were unfastened, yeah. just it makes it just crystal clear yes. a bit like in One Kings that, yeah. like, God is at work here. It's not just a kind of... Yeah, oh, but, there's an earthquake and that's it, you yeah, know, yeah, but yeah. actually it's a living God. Yeah. I like how you described it, Paul. It's like the most anticlimactic prison break. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Because they come back, the guard rushes in, they're all there. And yeah. Uh, Nobody's gone. But yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's just, I think it's a challenge for a lot of people, myself included, that, you know, how do we respond to hardship for him? Mm. Um, fearing God and like mm. speaking up for him or speaking just trying to like actually even if you're trying to lovingly ask people questions about faith mm-hmm. and having the kind of people's hack uh, you know hackles rising and stepping away from you as a friend mm. or a colleague whatever but just to consider a joyful thing and to be thankful mm. um could really transform how we even see like the idea of mission and mm. like speaking out and speaking up for the mm. Lord in whatever situation we find ourselves in. Um, so, yeah. And it's just amazing to think that actually, even in our hard things, even if we can't see something that's, you know, helping us maybe, mm. but we are growing in our faith, but also God could be using it to like show and expo- yeah. yeah, reveal the yeah. Lord to other people. Yeah. I don't, I, I can't, I can't say I've suffered terribly in my life. But maybe the last few times of difficulty, if I can think back, I don't think I had any thoughts in my mind at that time. Hey, the Lord might be using this to advance his gospel. I don't think that just even came into mm. my mind, you know, but yeah. and yet why not? Yeah. Why not? Yeah. And- I don't know that. I mean, the fact that this is like very dramatic, isn't it? Um, you do think, oh, that'd be great if, if my friends, you yeah, know, you like there's just like an earthquake recently, <laughs> a bit of fire from heaven. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, yes, that that doesn't always happen, does it? So, no, I, mean, well, I think that's yeah. one of the great things about this chapter because it's such a significant chapter. This is the gospel advancing into Europe for the first time. Mm. So you get this collection of three portraits of salvation, and they're just all so different. Mm-hmm. And the first is Lydia's, and that's just very normal. Um, Lydia, she's a merchant, she trades in purple cloth, and it describes her as a worshipper of God. So she's perhaps been in and around the synagogue, she is maybe familiar with the scriptures, but she's there listening to Paul, and we're told that the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by him, and she was then baptised. You cannot get more normal than that. She's yeah. sitting there and listening Tremendous. to somebody preach. Yeah. yeah, she repents and believes and is baptized. Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, you've got this Philippian jailer who's you know literally the, the earth has to shake beneath his feet. <laughs> but the Lord works in both, and you can work in both, yeah. and He is sovereign. Mm. But even Lydia's is a supernatural event. Like we can often downplay yeah. that, but that yeah. for someone's heart to be transformed that they would repent and believe that is a miraculous thing. Yes, yeah, uh, it doesn't need to be externally remarkable. Um, in both cases, it's a it's astonishing work of the Lord mm. to bring about salvation. So it can be an extraordinary. Mm. Yes. It can be through our sufferings, but it can also be very, very normal means of grace. Yeah. Mm. Uh, a regular Sunday, somebody coming along. Definitely. And I think um, you mentioned at the beginning of your sermon the fact that, you know, this is how God is building his kingdom. Yeah. And like so often 
maybe in Scotland, maybe in other countries, it doesn't always feel like that. It doesn't mm. always, like, it's hard to just remember God's promises that, you know, the kingdom of God will grow and it, you know, it is growing. And actually mm. God uses all different means and people and ways to, to do that. So it just, it makes you, I think it changes how you think about your life and your mission when you remember that the, the Lord is growing it. We we get to be involved, don't we? Yeah. It's the blessing of being part of his kingdom and being tools. But it's wonderful to know that the living God is the one who's growing it and nothing can stop him mm. and no one can stop him, even people chanting or shouting at you or whatever yeah, else. Yeah. So well, that's, you know, it's, I'm sure we can think of folk we know and just think about how they came to know the Lord. You never would have planned it. Yeah. Like you just, we yeah. couldn't. <laughs> um, you know, chance encounters, yeah. random things people see on the internet, mm-hmm. um, and they're, they're brought to a living faith. Yeah. Um, Does that mean we should maybe ask people more often how did they come to faith? Because that might really well, yeah, actually encourage very us. Encouraging, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I think we should do that more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I remember once being in a youth meeting and one of the leaders asked all the other leaders, how is it you became a Christian? Where did Christian things begin for you? And pretty much everyone in the room all put their hand up saying, well, my friend invited me to church. Hmm. <laughs> that just, that, you know, it was really striking. Or or my friend invited me to youth group when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. It just kept happening again and again and again. So yeah. powerful, but... Um, so it's good not to put... Um it God in a sort of yeah mm. cookie cut out. This is the one mm. way God uses people no. and how God works. It's not like yeah. that, but yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's really it's, it's really wonderful to to be remembering that. And um, Paul, are you going to be preaching on Acts next week? Or I'm not. That was not... actually a one off. Okay, okay, a one off treats. So yeah. I'm um, yeah, I'm not preaching next week. No, nope. I'm okay. on next Sunday morning, and uh, we're going to be looking at a little bit at the end of. We have a little bit of a change of pace, and we're gonna have a little bit at the end of First Kings eighteen, the bit we didn't look at. Yeah. Um, this business between Ahab and Elijah, and Elijah, although the text doesn't use the word prayer, he's clearly praying, and he's praying for rain, and this is where the Lord sends rain, and uh, there's a little business about the prophet uh, Elijah running ahead of uh, Ahab, as they both go to Jezreel. And that puzzles a lot of people. So we're going to look at that. Excellent. I'm looking forward to that. Well, thanks so much for joining us. And hopefully you'll be back next week. Mm